Hey folks, I'm delighted to have a legendary storyteller, Mike Burns on the Mind, Body, Soul podcast today. He was actually just chatting to me there about how it all started off, or not how it all started off, but in, in Montreal, I think. Mike, just telling us about how you'd have 100 people there and you'd be uh, telling stories. And I'd love to kind of plunge right back to that because it sounded like, you know, just a uh, mighty crack. It was. We moved to Montreal. I was living in Scotland for five years. And then we moved to Montreal. And big change because, of course, Montreal is the biggest bilingual city in the world. Mm. And I and a bunch of friends, we had a storytelling group called uh, Montreal Storytellers. And in a small little pub called La Petite Ricaine, which was owned by two Portuguese lads. And it took off like wildfire. Crazy how many people used to be there. And in the second half, we opened my kit. Um, and the only rule was you had to come once before you could volunteer to do the open mic. And then you could uh, do five minutes no more and we take the mic off you after. Because everyone thinks they can tell a story. <laughs> yes. And the world is full of people that will bend your ear and they'll drive you nuts. So if it's five minutes and it's off, it should just be over in a minute. Yeah. You, you survive, you know. But um, then we decided I said I'd have to do it in French because there was all these francophones who thought they spoke good English. And many of them did. But of course, with the Kerry accent. And, you know, when I'm telling, I'll have words in Irish and a phrase in Irish and I'll have like, carry expressions and, and, and if I get kind of carried away with myself, you know, the speed of delivery might sharpen a bit and the next yeah. thing they would, I mean, I was doing one in Concordia University one time, lovely woman, a geologist was there in the audience and she thought she'd manage it. There was a story I told, I asked her after how'd she get on. She says, all I knew was one head, two heads, three heads. Now, there, was a, there was a giant with one head, then there was a giant with two heads, then there was a giant with three heads. But the bloody story is like 40 minutes long, and all she got out of it was there was a fellow with one head. Too. So I decided I'd better start telling in French as well. And of course, you know, in, in telling in English or telling in Irish, I'm, I'm more at home and my French wasn't as good. Mm -hmm. But I, I'd have to find a way to do it. And I decided that what I do is I tell in, in what they call joal, which is like working class countryman French from Quebec. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, when I go to France telling there, even though I still tell in, in French Canadian joal, they still get it, you know. Yeah. I mean, a couple of the books, they have to have little footnotes where they'll explain some of the expressions for the, for the French from France. But the gist of the stories, and this is my take on it, you know, stories that are hundreds or in some cases even thousands of years old. Yeah. They're so solid. They've been polished, you know, like, you know, a rock up high up in the mountain when it falls into a stream, it is full of roughness. But by the time it gets down to the ocean, it is fairly smooth. And these yeah. are... These have been smoothened by, you know, the thousands of mouths that have told them. Uh, yeah. And so I says, you know, this they'll, they'll probably be strong enough that they'll get it even if my French isn't perfect. And mm -hmm. uh, Jesus, I love that friend. approach, though. Like I've listened to some of your French ones, and they're excellent. And uh, like I, I studied French at college, and that, and I, I actually found a big thing for me was confidence presenting in French because I felt that I was being judged, but it was nearly as much in my own mind. And so. My French teacher actually said to me, she goes, you go on and you embrace your accent and you speak as best you can, but don't worry about perfection. And since I've started doing that, actually presentations through French have gone much better. So I think also embracing your uniqueness as well as a, let's say a, a foreign speaker of the language. Well, uh, one of the things I've always found funny in Quebec because my accent, my French Canadian accent, I really sound like I come from somewhere in the sticks uh, in, in Quebec. Yeah. You know, you're Irish. Oh, so am I, she'll tell me, or he'll tell me after a show, you know. I go, you are, where are you from? And, and you know, I was my great-grandfather that came in mm. 1853 or so, you'll be going off. Yeah. <laughs> yes, for yeah. sure. But, yeah. Ah, they, 
the great thing about storytelling, like when we started in Montreal in 84, there's been huge interest everywhere all over the world now in traditional storytelling. And, and there's many variations and there's modern storytelling as well in the sense that you've got um, people that tell their own life stories or they tell science fiction-y sort of stuff or they tell, could be stories about the war. It could be extraordinary thing that I saw a woman telling in France one time about escaping from Rwanda. Mm. And, you know, the variety, the scope of stuff is vast. Yeah. The, the things that you were seeing that I did with uh, Scott McCloud, those uh, that, that became those graphic novels and that they've yes. been part and they've been published. That was a real change for me because mostly all I'd ever told was traditional South Kerry stories, you know, yes. stories that come from where I'm from. And, and then I got, well, couldn't you? I said, oh, I don't know if I could. And then I, I started talking to Jean-Pierre Kestemain, the historian, and actually one thing led to another. And before I knew where I was, the next thing is I had these ideas forming in my head. The original impetus for that was they wanted to, for tourists, they wanted to have a, a kind of a book that they could have and a story about how that part of Quebec, it's called L'Estrie or the Eastern Townships, how it was populated. Because unique among places in North America, there was no native people who actually were living there. Ah. And so there was nobody, there was no genocide involved in taking that land or taking that place. And mm. so you had Native Americans who came there when they were driven out of New England. That would be the, they're called Abenaki in Quebec, but I'm living in their territory now where I am is mm. Wabanak territory, right? Okay. Now in Maine. And they were driven out of here by the, by the, uh, settlers in New England and they moved in the late 1600s, early 1700s, they said to hell with this. We'll, and they went to the other side of the watershed, which is because we're near where the rivers drain north and south. You just, okay. I, can, I can see the mountains out the window here for me now. Nice. And so they went over that uh, and then they moved into Quebec. So there was the Wabanak and then there was there's a place called Scottstown in, in Quebec. Mm -hmm. They were all people who were driven off their land on the island of Lewis in Scotland. Oh, wow. The, the McLeod clan. In fact, there would be some of them probably distant relations of Donald Trump's mother, who was oh, a right. McLeod, who was a, a Gaelic speaking McLeod from the island of Lewis. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, English was her second language. Uh, and, and my mate, Scott McLeod, who's from that part of the world, one of the first things he had to find out was to make sure he was no relation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he yeah. called it if he found that he had any blood in common. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope he got the all clear. <laughs> he, did, he did, and he's, he's quite satisfied to relate it. So there was, there was them, they arrived Gaelic speaking in Quebec City, having been, had their passage paid across the Atlantic by the layer who was throwing them out because he'd make more money raising sheep than having them living in the black houses. Wow. And then there was, out of this place, there was people who were loyalists, who stayed loyal to the English crown after the War of Independence. And so they left New England and they went north to what was then Lower Canada, yeah, uh, which which is now Quebec, because they wanted to stay under the King of England, so there there was a whole bunch of them, and then there was the Irish that came after the famine. Well, there was the Irish already coming after the in the eighteen. There was a famine in Ireland, eighteen twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, which wasn't as bad as the Gulf of Moor, but it was yeah. bad, and, yeah. and there was a lot Irish. Then, of Irish came in the, in the 1847, 48, 49, 50. I remember, oh God, maybe nearly 20 years ago now, and my adult boy and girl were only kids then, and I was taking them camping up the end of the Gaspé, which is that long finger of land that reaches towards Ireland on the east coast of Canada. 
Mm. And uh, right at the end of it, in a place called Forillon, there was this Celtic cross. And I stopped the car I said to the kids. I said, wait a minute, I just want to see what's here. And there was an anchor there. And then I started crying. There was a boat that left Sligo in 47. And it made it all the way across the Atlantic and it went down a mile and a half from the spot where I was standing. Oh, wow. Of the hundreds of people, there was about 40 of them survived. Oh, God. And they started, there was a little village about another half mile on from where I was that they had started the survivors and they're still, their descendants are still oh. there now. And the anchor had been found by divers on the other side of the estuary, about eight or 10 miles away, being swept and swept and, and they, and they found it and identified it and brought it there with the cross. But, wow. oh my God, it put the heart sideways on Yeah, there. of course. And I mean, it's, it's obviously heartbreaking as well when you consider those who died. But in another sense, heartwarming when you see the community that was built, even this, you know, that, that came from that as well out there. Ah, oh, sure. I mean, they say in Quebec, you know, if you shot the genealogical tree of Quebec, there'd be a lot of feathers that fall down. And <laughs> there's so much native blood among French Canadians. Yeah. And somebody else said it to that. He says, yes, and the feathers would be green because, of course, 25% <laughs> of French Canadians have Irish blood. Wow. Wow. I, um, and yeah, I only realized the connection when I was looking, when I was reading up on you as well and like just find out more about because I wasn't so aware of just how many, how big an Irish influence there was out in Quebec. Yeah, they, they, well, they were Catholics. So, of course, they had the common enemy mm -hmm. that hated me <laughs> for them. And, yeah. uh, you know, they were fond of the jar and they were poor and yeah. they had many things in common. They found themselves thrown into similar circumstances, you know. Speaking of being fond of the jar, I was looking at one of your 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 videos about uh, the Irish and the Canadians. And I'm, I'm going to, I'd love to ask you to do a wee, a wee, even an introduction to a story in, if you'd be up for it, in the, in the three languages, because I just obviously love the, <laughs> the, the, the French dialect you speak. And, and I'd love to hear a little bit in English and a little bit in, in Irish, if you'd be up for that, Mike. I'd love to. I let me give you, let me start you off with something in Irish, a small one anyway, you know, just like... Yeah, in Tucker Fod. If I go too far with it, then you see, we'd, we'd lose people. But I'll give it to you in Irish, uh, and I'll give it to you in English after. Lovely, right? lovely, I, that'd be great. I heard this, I was, what, I was 11 years of age, I suppose, when I heard this from a man that was back in Balnerterig. Uh, he would have been in his 80s, so I suppose he's dead now. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so. The be a car on Louis, Augustine Reed and Gahershin. Augustine Grand Daddy Grish in a Rendlin in Osso Brick. Now Rishin, who shed Lee, why am I going to lock the egg? Vigama, Augustine Reb Gohok. After we saw Ragle and Rishin, the Machlok Teshlik Tak on the Karak, Agus Nach Mechel Massacre Shoe, their Higlihe. Dav Rishin, Dordisha, Gugur Figar, their Gak Gatak on the Karak. Gahene Hani Kuhu, Kush Fihestir. Dam Rodegur and Fear Nivia Ancient, yes, Gil Frisare. Ach Dam Rodegur Breg, Via Ancient, yes, Crock Fui and Law her bone wheelway. We had our own law, it was Henley Fair Hoover. Car goes, Erson Garb. Con Mokrock, Erson Fair. Brea Gerson Tarna Garb, Crock with me, dear. My young machine, dear. They can fear the inch to get. I was near Shed the Cat to go in and lock the inch to fear no crocker. We had a book, I was near a tear and hest or hin ille. Shine. Shine, pre her day. There was a king one time, and this will tell you how long ago it was because this king was death on people telling lies. Nowadays, of course, the game has changed completely. They'd be lying 
when they'd be talking to the whole bloody time. But he, was, he put laws against lying in his city and that was going great. The people might be lying in secret or they might just, do, but generally lying was against the law. But your man, he was a bit scared that there'd be traveling people coming to the city from other places and that they would spread the bad habit among his own population. So what did he do but this? He put guards and the four gates into the city. And every man that had come to the city, then he'd be asked a question. If he told the truth, he could go free. But if he told a lie, they'd hang him. They were there one day, and there was a man came to them. Car goish, Ersen Garda, where are you going, says the girl. I'm going to be hung, says the man. That's a lie, says the second guard. Hang him. But the first guard says, Cripes, and if we hang him, won't he be after telling the truth? And we don't have the right to hang people that tell the truth. They were stuck, and they didn't solve it from that day to this. There you have it. Now, put on the kitchen. Oh. They, if they didn't live happy, may ye. <laughs> Oh, here's, the, here's the queer thing about that now. I went to London to study oriental medicine after I left Cahar. And uh, I had these friends who were studying Sufi in the Sufi tradition. Uh, two beautiful sisters, Diana and what was the name of the other lesson? Anyways, she told me a story. Diana told me a story. What story? She just told me that story that I got from a man in his 80s back in Balnertere, a man that had no word of English, that never left the parish he was born in, that had lived his whole life there. And she had the same story coming from Syria. Incredible. We, go, we have the same stories all over the world. It's mm. amazing, you know. Mm. Anyway, there's, there's a short little thing here. Ask Gwen, as the man says. Yeah. Yeah. Rallo man piece of shin I ran through Ask Gwen. So Neil mo Neil mo kaid on cord le le shin, but we say just their house on on Gail get shin a crushed all own uh own balin ear ear he no. Balin ear ear. Carpe green yeah. Ah, so fresh. Go Holland. Go Holland. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you another one now. I'll give you one in English now. This isn't one of the stories that I ever heard when I was a young fellow growing up. This is a story I got from an Englishman and I stole it from him. But should they stole enough from us, we could steal back from them. No, no, he gave, he gave me permission to tell it. It's a, <laughs> um, it's a native story. It's from the Lakota Sioux, from uh, out where west from here. So anyways. Long ago and long ago and long ago it was, before your time and before my time. And if you were there, then you wouldn't be here now. Or if you did succeed in being in the two places at the one time, by the front tooth or the back tooth or lump in the gum or the furthest back tooth in your head to be for a staff in your hand to you. This is so long ago that it was in the morning of the world. There was a hunter. No ordinary hunter. That man was the finest hunter that ever set foot walking the back of this broad world. He knew where all the animals went to hibernate. He knew where they went to drink and he knew where they went to forage. He could take them with snare, with spear, with bow and arrow. And he was a generous, kind man. It was said about him that if the form of the sea was silver, and the leaves of the autumn were gold, he would have given it all away. There wasn't a mouth that went hungry in his village. There was no woman that didn't have skins to make warm clothes to keep the children in the winter. But of course, like me, he had a flaw. This man, his weakness was gambling. He was so fond of the born dice. On a day of days, he took his spear, he took his quiver and his arrows and his bow, and he set out in his trail through the forest. And he wasn't gone that long when he came to a clearing. And on the other side of the clearing, there was an old man. 
old, sweet God in heaven, that fellow was old. He had only one tooth left in his head, and that tooth grown so long he was using his staff in his hand to help him to walk around the place. He was bowed down with the age. She was like an ambulant question mark in his face, I swear to God in heaven. It was like a labyrinth for testing the intelligence of tears. There was that many wrinkles in it. <laughs> the mouth he had in him, I swear to God, it was like a graveyard where teeth go to die. But he had these two eyes shining, flames burning in them. And he held up a skinny, bony finger and he pointed it at the hunter and he says, Hunter, he said, Hunter, will you gamble with me? Gamble, says the hunter. Gamble, what do we gamble for? And the old man took out the bone dice and he said to him, he says, We'll gamble for your spear. My spear? Did you fall on your head? Is it daft you are? For Christ's sake, my spear, the shaft of this spear is made of the hat of red oak. And the, the head of the spear, I gave a winter entirely fashioning the stone it's made from. My spear, what have you got that's worth my spear? And the old man put his hand that was into his mall oskel and he took out a wand. He said, your spear against this nut. And I forgot. This is no ordinary walnut, he said. And he separated barely the two halves of the walnut. And this golden light came out. He says, look inside, hunter. And the hunter put his eye to the little crack in the walnut and he looked in and inside there there was these animals of a grace and elegance and beauty animals that he didn't know a man that knew every animal that walked swam ran climbed or flew and behind them the meadows rising to hills and beyond that mountains and those mountains with their heads dreaming in the clouds. And he said to the old man, he said, give me the dice. And he took the bone dice and he spat once for luck. And he rolled them. And he lost. And he handed his spear to the old man, but the old man raised his bony finger and he says, Hunter, you'll gamble again. What would you have me gamble for now? If you win, I'll give you back your spear and I'll give you the walnut. And if I lose? If you lose, I'll take your bow and your arrows. My bow. I'm the only man that can string this bow. And these arrows are fletched with the feathers of eagle. I was three days on the top of the mountain hiding. I still have the scars of the claws on my forearms. But he thought, he thought of those animals of a grace and elegance and beauty. And he said, give me the dice. And he took the bone dice and he spat once for luck. And he rolled. But the old man pointed a skinny, bony finger and he said, Hunter, you will gamble again. The hunter looked at him and he said, you have taken my spear, you have taken my bow, you have taken my arrows. What will you take from me now? And the old man said, if you lose, I will take you from this world. 
No more will you see your companions of the ale feast or of the hunt. No more will you see your children or your wife. But if you win, if you win, I will give you bow and arrows, I will give you spear, and I will give you the walnut. And the hunter thought of his companions of the ale feast and of the hunt. And he thought of his little children. But above all, he thought of his wife. A woman so beautiful, he thought that the world was a flowery meadow as a carpet beneath her feet. But he also thought of those animals, of a grace and elegance and beauty. And he said, give me, give me the dice. And he took the dice and he spat once for And he fell into a darkness at the speed of a dark, until all that was left was the sound of the stars, and then nothing, nothing. Hey, stop! Hey, 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 hey! He was being kicked in his sides and his ribs. Stop! Stop! That hurts! And he opened an eye and he looked up. And there was the old man leaning over him as he lay on grass, pointing a thin bony finger at him saying, Hunter, you will gamble again. And he raised himself on an elbow and he looked. And there, so close he could almost touch them, were the animals of an elegance and grace and beauty. And behind them, hills, and beyond those mountains, dreaming in the clouds. He was in that world. And he pulled himself up, and he looked at the old man, and he said, What would you take from me now? And the old man said, If you lose, if you lose, I will take everything from you. I will take you even from this world. I will take you from all worlds. It will be as if you have never been. Nobody will sing you or tell you. But if you win, I will give you back your spear, your bow, your arrows. And I will let you go back to your world. And you can bring of these animals with you. Hunter reached out and he said, Give me the dice. And he spat once for luck. And he rolled them. And this time, this time, The old man handed him spear, bow, and arrows, and turning, he pointed to the animals, and he said, call them, and they will come to you. And he turned, and he called them, and they came to him. And he turned, and he walked, and he walked, and he walked, and he turned, and he called them, and they came to him. And he turned, and he walked, and he walked, and he walked. He walked that far that he walked from that world to this. And that is how horses came into the world. Beautiful. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> wow. No, that's excellent, Mike. Excellent. Jeez, you, you had me hook, line and sinker, huh? Oh, for God's sake. I love that story. Oh. Me too. Jeannie, Mac. I've never heard it before. That was amazing. Thank you. God, and I found myself leaning in, you know. I couldn't get any closer to the screen. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, excellent, excellent. And um, oh God, also the one though as well that you told Oscar um, about, yeah, you know, about the, the lion, Jeannie. Yeah, it's lovely, lovely to hear it in the native tongue as well. Um, I was just wondering, one final request, one last roll of the dice. Um, do you have a wee one in French by any chance that you can tell in that sort of nice local dialect that you have? Oh my God, it's something small, something short. Eh? Okay. This is an Irish story, but mm -hmm. I'll give it to you in French because I, I work more in French than I do in English now, to tell the honest to God truth. You know, although with the pandemic, we weren't doing any traveling and no festivals or any of that crack. Yeah, but, it's tough. Yeah. Parce que c'est dans le temps, avant votre temps, mais c'était le temps de quelqu'un. Dans ce temps-là, il y avait un gars qui était fermier. Il était pauvre. Il était tellement pauvre qu'il était riche en pauvreté. Il n'y avait rien que lui puis son vieux père qui habitait dans la cabane ensemble. Puis il trouvait, je ne sais pas quelle maladie lui avait pris dans la tête, mais il trouvait que ça serait bien de se faire marier. Fait qu'il s'est pris une femme en mariage. Puis on dit toujours que l'amour est aveugle, mais il faut ajouter que c'est le mariage qui ouvre grand les yeux. Parce que quand il était avec, je t'ai dit que elle n'était pas contente, elle était obligée de donner à manger au vieux. Le vieux qui était assis à côté du foyer, qui faisait jamais rien, qui pouvait plus travailler, qui était bien usé par la misère puis la pauvreté. Et comme ça peut arriver n'importe qui, ben elle est tombée enceinte. Ben là, là, quand elle savait qu'elle avait un bébé qui s'en venait, elle en voulait encore plus au vieillard. Elle ne voulait plus donner quoi que ce soit à manger parce qu'ils avaient tellement peu. Puis elle continuait à travailler son homme, qu'il devrait mettre son père dehors, qu'il devrait le mettre sur les routes du monde, puis le bannir de la maison, puis l'envoyer pour quitter, prendre le monde comme son oreiller, puis le ciel bleu comme sa couverture. Mais le bonhomme, il aimait bien son père. Il ne voulait pas le mettre dehors. Après trois espaces de temps, ben, la femme, elle met bas. Elle accouche de son enfant. Un beau petit garçon, je te dis, il était beau, cet enfant-là. Un petit cœur. Caroline qui était beau. Mais là, elle avait son bébé dans la crèche. Elle le vieux à côté du foyer, elle n'en pouvait plus. Fait elle continue à harceler son mari qu'il faut qu'il mette le père dehors. Et puis finalement, pour acheter la paix, il a dit oui. Fait il dit son père. Au Québec, on dit son père pour dire mon père. Il dit son père, il faudrait bien que tu partes, que tu prennes les routes. On est trop pauvre, on ne peut pas nourrir quatre bouches dans notre maison. Tu sais bien qu'on a tellement peu. Puis le vieux, consterné, mais il ne savait pas quoi faire. Il se lève, il s'en va vers la porte, il pleure des chaudes larmes et il se tourne quand il est à la seuil de la porte. Puis il dit, fiston, fiston, donne-moi au moins une couverture pour que je puisse me garder au chaud. Je vais mourir du fret. Et le fermier, il s'en va pour aller chercher une couverture pour donner à son père qu'il met dehors de la maison. Mais de la crèche, l'enfant qui n'a que trois mois, on a entendu deux la moitié. Ah, le bébé a parlé, un bébé de trois mois. Tout le monde se met autour de la crèche. Tu as parlé, mon fils. Tu as parlé. Quel miracle. Pourquoi tu as dit de lui donner rien que la moitié? 
Et le petit jeune qui regarde son père, puis il dit, « Parce que l'autre moitié, ça va être pour toi, papa. » Excellent. Alors, do you want me to translate it? Non, j'ai... Um, non, uh, so, à la fin, le, la dernière phrase, ça veut dire euh, moitié pour le père et moitié pour le grand-père. Parce que le petit bébé dit, toi à ton tour, tu vas vivre le même sort que toi tu es en train ah, de vivre. Ah, super. Oui, oui, ah. oui. Yeah, no, I think also for people maybe listening in English, uh, but uh, God, that was brilliant. So for people listening in English, you maybe have a little French uh, and uh, want to follow and... So, can you explain a wee bit or maybe go through that? I think that'd be nice. It's a, a farmer that's very poor and he's living alone in a very poor house. They didn't have more than the grass, three or four cows, and they didn't even have the base on it. And his old father was very tired and worn down and broken with the misery of life and po poverty, and he was good for nothing. All he could do was sit beside the fire and be fed. And sometimes maybe buy him a little piece of tobacco to stick in the pipe. And I don't know what madness took the farmer, but he decided to get married. And he took a woman to wed. As they say, love is blind, but marriage is a great eye opener. <laughs> and he got his come up because the missus, she was one of these people that wouldn't give the steam of their piss to the poor. She was very tight fisted and mean altogether. And she resented every mouthful that was given to that poor man that was sitting down by the fireplace. And she was always working uh, at the husband. You should throw him out. We should get rid of him. We should make him walk the roads. He can become a beggar man. He could take the world as his pillow and the sky over it as his blanket. Get rid of him now. But uh, your man loved his father and he didn't want to do it. And he was, long story short and a short story, Mary, the woman got pregnant and in three spaces of time she had a child. And the child there in the cradle, now things were getting very tight because they had four mouths in the house instead of three. Mm -hmm. And now she never left off with giving, complaining and, oh my God, talk about Arselman and just get, the, get your men out of there. And finally to buy peace, The farmer says to his father, he says, father, he says, you'll have to go. He says, I'm sorry, but sure you can see the way it is in the house. She's driving me mad entirely and she hates your guts. You'll have to go on the roads and become a beggar man and take your look like that. And the old man, he was crying. He went to go to the door and he's standing in the threshold. He turned and he said, uh, Couldn't you at least give me a blanket to keep myself warm? I'll perish with the cold. And the father of the baby in the cradle went to get a blanket for his own father to give it to him so he could carry it with him when he was driven out. But if he did, a voice came from the cradle. The three-month-old inside in the cradle said, only give him half the blanket. Oh, my God, the child spoke. Oh, sweet God in heaven. And they all gathered around the cradle and the farmer looking down at his son and said, they're three months old and you spoke, child. What do you mean I should only give him half the blanket? And the child looked up at his father and he says, because you will need the other half when your turn comes. <laughs> wow, nice. There you have it. There's a little fable there for us as well. <laughs> Uh, Mike, um, look, I have to say a massive thank you, right, uh, for uh, just that was, I love it, like, and, and, and I mean, I, I had the pleasure of studying Irish folklore, and actually Dermot told me about yourself, and we were we were out uh, having a big feed of ribs one time in, in Brussels and a few beers, and he says, he says, uh, he goes, my relative is one of the last storytellers, um, you know, kind of out there, and Um, in, in Ireland and I thought God it's in many ways not that it's a shame because it sounds like it's thriving when, when you chat to you and there's plenty going on but I feel like a lot of us are unaware uh -huh. of, of the storytelling there's, you know, a great, the there's, a in, there's a great festival in Clare Island Ilan Clare down off the coast of Cork and there's a great festival in Sneem 
uh, a cousin of mine, Betty Burns, who Betty must be in his mid eighties now, I suppose. So I don't know if he's doing much telling anymore, but mm. Betty started the festival in Sneem years ago. And there are storytelling events happening. Uh, I was at one up in Merrion Square one time. There's, there was a woman called Liz Weir. There's a fellow called Paddy Spate, who's a great teller from Cork City. Mm. He has the Cork accent, you know, like that. What? Yeah, Got yeah. a smoking butter, boy! Ah, yeah, Pat's a lovely lad, great teller. Liz Weir from the north. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, there's, there's great tellers in Ireland. There's tellers all over the place. I mean, there's festivals beyond the border in Wales. There's mm. amazing festivals in England and Scotland. Yeah. And as you said as well, like stories that when you said the Syrian woman having the same story, right? It's uh, oh, yeah. like yeah. it's universal, which is amazing. But I also want to ask you for, for listeners because I was spellbound and I imagine people listening in were, where can they find out more about you, Mike? And I, I'll put all the, I'll put all the links in the show notes for people to get access to your material. Um, I know you sent me some, some links as well, so I can share all of them as well. Right. Well, we have, we have four graphic novels and four short animated movies, myself and a lad called Scott McLeod. Mm -hmm. So those are at McLeod nine. You can have the link for that. Yeah. Um, they're, historical stories uh, about the the first arrivals of different peoples to that part of Quebec I was talking about. And then there's um, Planet Rebel, which is a publishing house in Montreal. They have a bunch of stuff of mine. They have, uh, oh, they must have me on 10 or 15 different CDs. They have a book uh, full of stories. The, the, the books come with CDs as well. So and then they have them online. People can download the stories. Those are all in French. And then there's uh, Les Editions We Dear in France. Uh, Pascal must have five or six different recordings of me at least anyways, maybe mm. more. And then there's um, Storytellers of Canada. They have a big, long, one big story that's on three CDs, but that's also downloadable. Yeah. Storytellers of Canada, the, the project is called Story Save, and the story is called Makani Eskide, which is about, it's about an hour long story, you know, mm. maybe mm. more. It's it. What was interesting, I, I, I told it in Irish, in French, and in English, and it comes out three totally different lengths, of course, because, wow. you know, it's like, storytelling is a bit like jazz, you know, like it depends on what grace note you decide to put in there, or, you know. Yeah. A, yeah, it isn't classical music in any case, you know. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, but so there, yeah. there's a couple of places. And then I, I used to tell in Montreal for 20 years, we did uh, Hurley's Irish Pub. We used to do the last Sunday of every month, myself and a, a lad by the name of Toby Kinsley, Lord to mercy on him, who was a, an Ilan Piper and a harpist and a, or, my God, multi-instrumentalist. <laughs> you know, so Toby and myself, we worked together at Hurley's for years. And, I was a lot of great. Well, I'm going to supply all of those links to people. I just have a couple of last questions. So, if someone's now inspired and, and listened to you, is storytelling something that you know kind of is, is more of a calling that comes naturally, or could somebody watching this be like, geez, I'd, I'd love to develop my skills here? And if so, you know, how do you go about doing that? There are storytelling <laughs> workshops. I mean, I have taught people, uh, in fact. The, the workshop that I most commonly give uh, has a very tight relationship with my martial arts background because uh, the whole notion of taking your place, of, of being responsible for your space is, is really... So, so those I do for people who are already performers rather than for beginners. But there are people who do workshops and help people to learn how to do storytelling. And there's a lot of storytelling events where they do, as I said, we used to do at La Petite Rican an open mic event, you know, mm. where they give people a chance to polish their chops and, and you know, what we started, myself and three mates of mine, we started a thing called um, uh, the, the Regroupement du Comte du Québec, a uh, storytelling group, uh, work on promoting storytelling and funding and there are groups like that all over the world now. And they do regular workshops where they train people, where they help people. And then they 
coordinate. Uh, there's there's um, money is even available from art councils and stuff. When once people get going a bit, where they can work even harder at it. And if somebody wants to, I mean, when we started the Le Groupe Magic Count, there were probably no more than about 10, 12 professional storytellers in Quebec. The last I looked, and you know, I, I left Montreal seven and a half years ago to move here to the, to the mountains in the west of Maine, but um, there are 120 or 130 professional storytellers wow. now. And that's just in Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh, Toronto, there's, probably more because it's been going there longer, the revival of storytelling. There was an Irish woman from Belfast, Alice Kane, who was very important and a, a lovely Romanian Jew from California called Dan Yashinsky, who, who back around 78 started uh, what they call a thousand and one night. So every Friday night in Toronto since then, and they've never missed a beat. Wow. Uh, so they've gone past the thousand and one nights by now. They've been more <laughs> they're redefining it. Yeah, um, but but yeah. they they do work everywhere, you know. Like okay. so there is a lot of opportunities. And then just to, to to wrap up, I just want to ask you in terms of storytelling, like for you, what what sense does it offer the world, if you know what I mean, or what's the deeper what's the deeper sort of meaning to it all? Well, you know we. I think that there are a couple of things that define us as human beings. I think cooking is one, <laughs> fire, mm -hmm. and language and storytelling is probably the other second major thing that happens that makes us, that's where we become human. Whenever it is, is it 300,000 or a, uh, a quarter of a million years ago, whenever, but fire and language are the mm -hmm. two things. And for most, Let's say from 100,000 years ago to now, we've only been doing farming for about 10, 12,000 years. But we've been doing storytelling for at least 100,000. Mm. And so this is as old as it gets with us. This, yeah. is, this is something that is so profound inside us as part of who we are as a species. And we love to tell and be told stories. Is there one thing that characterizes people's experience of Ireland, it's that people love to chat. And, mm. and mm. we love, you know, and, and when people from elsewhere come to Ireland and get around Irish people, it's one of the things they love about us. And there's something extraordinary about that, that this little island on the west of, of Europe sort of added on there like a, an apostrophe or a comma or something. <laughs> but, but it's still kept. I'll give you an example. Folklorists have collected about 800 versions of the Cinderella story in Europe. 640 of those were in Ireland. Wow. So we have had this incredibly deep, deep, rich well of stuff that got lost elsewhere earlier. Partly because we were on the periphery and partly because we had uh, you know, an empire's boot down on our throat. And so we didn't, we were left with nothing else. Mm. And, and all they had was the language and the stories. You know, the uh, You can have the islands and I'll have the tunes, is, <laughs> is what a man said after Elizabeth I defeated them at Kakyuntal. Mm. Uh, mm. They could and the, the same thing is told of a caravan crossing the Sahara and being raided by uh, vagabond rapparees who steal the camels and steal their instruments. And there's one musician who's really upset and he's telling the other guy that his chorus has been, the chorus of the kind of a harp-like West African instrument, magnificent instrument. <laughs> The old musician says to the young musician, it's all right, he says, they didn't steal the tunes. You know? <laughs> it's, it's very deep for us. Um, I think as a species, the, the word storytelling has been appropriated by everybody and mother use it in you know, workshops and they use it in sales and, and they're full of shite, if you'll excuse the expression, because they're just using the word storytelling. But the real 
art of oral storytelling where people sit in a circle or around a fire and you don't need a microphone and you don't need electricity and you don't need any artifice whatsoever at its most basic. Mm. There's a sense of community and healing that happens to us when we do that. There's something very close. You know that, that run that I started, the second story I told you? Once and once and once in very good times. It wasn't your time, it wasn't my time, it was yeah. so Those runs are very similar to hypnotic inductions. Uh, and the, there's a kind of trance state that happens to yeah. us yeah, when sure. storytelling happens. And Toby and myself would always do a, an autopsy after every gig that we would do, you know, because we, how do you make it better, you know, because you, I've been doing storytelling for more than 50 years now, you know, but it doesn't mean that you should get lazy about it. You should always, you know, like, yeah. Continuous improvement, right? Can you, is there like, what was, what worked? What was, and the thing that's there is that you kind of come to this art and you hope that you'll be struck by lightning. You know, sometimes you're just in the zone and it's like, I can still remember scoring some goals when I was a footballer, you know, mm. where, you go left and right and you leave your man dead. Mm. And the keeper thinks it's gone that way and it's gone the other way. And it's like <laughs> time is totally slowed down for you. And I think there's something similar happens when storytelling is really working, you know? Like it, you just get into a place which is magical and healing and everybody feels happy afterwards, you know? Even if you tell stuff that can be really sad or tragic, mm bring tears to your eyes. I, there's a story that I was asked to create and Pascal uh, made a CD of it. It's called uh, Mavron and Variga, My Grief on the Sea, which is taken from an old Irish song. Mavron and Variga nach ea tamur, a sheena gajoi did meis mobile store. And it's a woman singing about her love who's on the other side of the ocean. Mm. And I start that story with the song and then I sing it in Irish, I sing it in English. And then, and it's the story of the construction of the Rideau Canal, which was the, this canal that was built from where Ottawa is now to where Kingston is. Mm. And the reason I was asked to do it is because I have a mate of mine, Kevin, who was an old Union man, an old seaman, used to be a merchant Navy boy. And Kevin lives in Ottawa and he is very interested in Gaelic. He, he, he has decent Irish for a man that uh, grew up in Mullingar. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he went to Tory Island to learn Irish with the people there. Yeah. And it was long story, a short, a short story, Mary. Kevin learned the history of the building of the Rideau Canal. 4,000 men built that canal and a thousand of them died in the building. Wow. Wow. And they were all Irish. And there isn't or well, there is now because of Kevin, but there was no commemoration or no stone or no cross. They were thrown into mass graves, some of these fellas. There wasn't even a stone raised in a field for them. And Kevin and a couple of mates of his asked me if I wouldn't make a story out of it because it was for the 100th anniversary of the 150th anniversary of the completion of the of the thing, or 175th, whatever anniversary it was anyways. And I went to the National Library and I got images and I studied all about it. And then I was rebuilding my kitchen in Montreal at the time. And I went in there one day and I just took a, a, a DAT, a digital audio tape machine that was state of the art at the time. And I just told the story that had formed in my head. And lo and behold, you know what, there it was. It, it was, I birthed this thing fully formed, you know? It's about an hour, an hour and a quarter, something like that to tell it. Yeah. So the first time I told it in public, and that's the reason I'm talking to you about this. I told it in a big circular hall in Ottawa with 300 people. And two thirds of the people that were in that room were descendants of the survivors oh, wow. 
of the building of the canal. Uh -huh. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. Myself included, I couldn't move. I was, I was just weeping on the stage when I finished the damn thing. It finishes with her singing that song again. It goes full circle. But it's really important that we tell our stories, our history, the mythologies, you know, uh, and, and the old stories that are part of the Shanachas are important to describe who we are in our uniqueness and in our commonality with every other person in the world. Mm -hmm. I have the story, I'm sure you've heard the story of Laura Lee with the horse's ears. I don't think so. Okay, so anyway, a king that was in Ireland who had horse's ears and, and it's about the misfortune. I'll tell it you another time. We have plenty of time. Yeah. Um, it's a long story. But anyways, I go to Lebanon to tell the festival there. And my friend Jihad Darwish is a Lebanese storyteller. Mm -hmm. And he started a project. Lebanon is a country that's very scarred because of the religious wars and, and all the different communities. And there are, I think, 11 different spiritual communities, some yeah. of who are allied with others and some who hate each other. And Jihad started this extraordinary project in every primary school in Lebanon, where they got the young ones, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years of age, to go and gather stories from their old ones. And then to tell them. And in the festival, Every night for this week and a half or whatever it was that we were there for the festival, there'd be three young ones would come and they'd tell a little five, six, seven minute story. So one night there's this gorgeous little girl. She's about eight or nine. She's as brown as a russet apple with this beautiful curls of dark black, jet black hair. And she stands there and she gives out a story. <laughs> and the story was the beginning of where the bloody horse's ears came from. <laughs> so here I have this story that they found, a, they found a stone carving somewhere in County Meath back in the 90s of this king with the horse's ears and their radiocarbon dated it to about three and a half thousand years ago. Wow. So here's this story that's been traveling that long in Ireland or somewhere around that anywhere, easily 3000 years. And then I find myself thousands of miles away and here's the missing part, the beginning part, the chapter, the foreword to the story. Yeah. Wow. I ran up to the little girl afterwards and, and she spoke French uh, and Arabic. My Arabic is non-existent, but I, we spoke French. And uh, I asked her where she got it. It was her grandmother that gave it to her. Wow. And, she, and I asked where she came from. And she came from the mountains on the border with Syria. And I was just flabbergasted that, you know, it dovetailed perfectly. Amazing. Nice. When, I, when you say commonality, that we're different and we have our uniqueness and we have our own little Irishness or our whichever. Yeah. We also share the exact same, you know, journey as yeah. everybody else walking the back of this world, you know. So storytelling can help us touch that. Yeah, love it. Mike, I think, look, that's a great place. I, I, I for sure want to get you back on because even when you mentioned some of those other stories, I would love to have you back on at some point. So I just have to say a massive thank you for today. You've touched, uh, definitely, I, I've felt myself touched as well with those stories that you've telling. And I can just see just the emotion that you, that, that it, it, it also, um, I suppose that it triggers in you as well. And that is really infectious. So, you know, thanks a million for coming on. I really appreciate your time. Oh, the pleasure is mine. Thank you. <laughs>